Hello and welcome to our study, our continuing study in the book of Acts. We are ready for uh, chapter number 27, almost finished with the book. Uh, I urge you, if you have not had the opportunity to go back and listen to our previous classes, there's a playlist with all of the Acts lessons in it at our YouTube channel, at uh, uh, well, the Pepper Road Church YouTube channel. So just start at lesson one and, and uh, work your way through and catch up to where we are now. I want to say a quick word of welcome to the fellows I have helping me out here. Uh, we have a couple of our deacons with us, Tony Sexton and Bryce Luffman, and also with us, Isaac Munoz. So thank you, fellas, for helping me out with the study today. Just to give you a quick um, uh, rundown as to where we left off, Paul has, for the last few chapters, been uh, really undergoing a series of hearings and trials in which he presents his defense in front of folks in order to explain what had happened when he arrived at Jerusalem uh, way back, and I think back, back in chapter 21 uh, of the book of Acts. And uh, he went to the temple, and then a, a riot broke out because of him, nothing that, that he was responsible for. It was, it was other people who got angry at him, not because he was provoking anything. And now he has stood before the leadership of his people. He's stood before a couple of, uh, of governors. Um, and finally, he has appealed to Caesar. Uh, none of the people who, well, I should say none of the, the Roman officials who have been involved have found anything worthy of, of death in him. But he appealed to Caesar so as not to have to go back to Jerusalem and stand before his, his own people's mm -hmm. council again, because it was pretty clear that they were going to do whatever they had to do to get him put to death. And so now, as we enter into Acts chapter 27, uh, we see Paul uh, embarking on a journey that will ultimately take him to Rome. I will make a quick note. If you look at the first verse of Acts chapter 27, we see Luke adopt a pattern that he has adopted in other places in the book. He says, and when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, um, we have noted off and on throughout the book when Luke is speaking purely in the third person and when he also speaks in the first person. And so uh, because Luke is speaking here in the first person, we can interpret that to mean that, uh, that, that this is not Luke getting this somehow uh, after the fact uh, or in any way secondhand, but in fact, Luke was accompanying Paul on this journey. So Paul does not go alone on this journey. He has, he has friends, brethren who go with him on this journey. I'll point something else out here. This, this, this is uh, some information that I found in Johnny Stringer's commentary on the book of Acts. Uh, he says, in writing on Paul's voyage to Rome, commenters have a long, or commentators rather, have long relied on James Smith's classic, The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul. Smith was an accomplished yachtsman <clears throat> who studied Luke's account in light of his detailed knowledge of the Mediterranean Sea, sailing, and the ships of the ancients. And so here's his conclusion. He has a, a somewhat lengthy quote here from Mr. Smith. No sailor, he writes, would have written in a style so little like that of a sailor. No man like, uh, not a sailor could have written a narrative of a sea voyage so consistent in all its parts, unless from actual observation. So if I can pause for just a minute, let's, let, let's, let's note what he's saying there. He's saying, okay, Luke is clearly not a sailor. Sailors would not write like this. And at the same time, Luke would not have written like this unless he'd seen all these things with his own eyes. So this gets to, um, number one, the historical, and you might even say geographic accuracy of what Luke is writing here. And also it gets to the, uh, the, the, the proof of his authorship. Whoever this person is who is writing in first person saw these things with his own eyes. Well, continuing with Mr. Mis Mr. Uh, Smith's quote here, he says, this peculiarity of style is to me in itself a demonstration that the narrative of the voyage is an account of real events written by an eyewitness. A similar remark may be made on the geographical details. They must have been taken from actual observation for the geographical knowledge of the age was not such as to enable a writer to be so minutely accurate in any other way. So I thought that was really interesting. The, 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 all the detail that Luke gives us here of this journey can give us great confidence, uh, not only that Luke was on the ship with Paul, but also that, that Luke is telling the truth about where they went, because 
because if you, if you were to go back and retrace their steps, you would find things exactly as uh, Luke writes them here. Well, um, I've gotten a number of questions here, and uh, I've assigned them to the fellas here, and so I'm going to toss the first question to Stony, uh, to Tony rather. Uh, we have a fellow by the name of Aristarchus who is mentioned here uh, as another traveling companion of Paul's on this journey. So, Tony, tell me about Aristarchus, and where have we seen him before? Aristarchus was uh, from Macedonia. He was uh, a Thessalonian in particular, and we first see him as... as, as nearly as I can tell, the first time we see him is in back in chapter 19 uh, in Ephesus, when, of course, the big uproar happened uh, in Ephesus at the theater, where the this mob, this crowd came together in the theater, and uh, Aristarchus was there, and, and it says that the, the crowd seized him and took him into the theater. Paul wanted to go in, but the, the disciples would not allow him to go in. So Aristarchus is in this huge mob, and the, the it's just loud, and it, it's crazy, and uh, there's just chaos going on. Some of them even don't know why they're there, but just a uh, just a almost a mob situation going on with a lot of noise and confusion, and uh, finally the town clerk gets everybody's attention, and the voice of reason uh, kind of takes over, and, and he... Um, calms him down and tells him, we better dismiss. And so they do, they dismiss and leave. Well, here Aristarchus had a, a, an opportunity to abandon Paul because you might've thought, he might've thought wherever Paul goes, mob and violence ensues. So my life is in danger. So he might've, he might've had the opportunity to take off right there, but he didn't. Because we see him in chapter 20, still with Paul. And he's still traveling with Paul. And they go to, to Troas. And so uh, that so we see Aristarchus is with Paul in chapter 19 at Ephesus. And chapter 20, uh, when they came together to break bread. Uh, and now we see him here in chapter 27. And he is described... Uh, at some point as a traveling companion of Paul. And he's, he's traveling with Paul here in, on the journey to Rome. But I don't know if he is just a companion or if he is actually a prisoner because we see in, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, that, that Paul calls Aristarchus my fellow prisoner. And that was a letter that Paul wrote from prison. So uh, it could be, and uh, you guys may have an opinion on this, uh, that Aristarchus was one of the prisoners that was being transported along with Paul to, to Rome. Um, but one way or the other, I think we see a lot, if you put all of these passages together, you see a lot about the character of Aristarchus. He is not one who is putting himself forward uh for for fame i mean this was this was not what you do for fame this is what you do because you believe that the truth is being taught and you are you love souls and you want to save souls because if you want popularity this is not the way to gain popularity but it reminds me of of what paul wrote to timothy in the second letter second timothy chapter one verse nine where paul says be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. So Paul was telling Timothy, do not be ashamed of me, in, even though I am a prisoner. I'm a jailbird. But please don't be ashamed of me. Aristarchus was not ashamed of Paul, even though he was a prisoner. In fact, he himself was a prisoner with Paul. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, certainly later on, he is called that fellow prisoner. And I, I it's just hard to say exactly what his status is here for certain. Uh, but at the very least, he's accompanying Paul. I, I love the point you made there uh, about uh, his, the fact that he did not abandon Paul in any of this. Uh, in, in fact, he seems to cling all the closer to him, uh, regardless of all those things. And I guess I, I will make one more observation here with regard to being certain that this is the same Aristarchus. You know, we, we see... Uh, the same names pop up here and there throughout the scriptures. And sometimes it's hard to say, well, is, is, is this the same Jude? Uh, is this the same whoever? 
Um, well, uh, as you pointed out, he's called uh, he's called a Thessalonian um, in here in Acts chapter 27. Uh, and then the other places that we see him pointed out uh, back in 19, it says Aristarchus, well, Gaius, another a fellow Macedonian, and then Aristarchus, they're called Macedonians. And then uh, in Acts chapter 20, uh, again, he's called a Thessalonian. So, um, so this does seem to be the same fellow who has been with him uh, the whole time. Just, just wanted to go ahead and, and, and sort of sort of dot that I there, uh, because we can't necessarily take it for granted just because it's the same name, that it's certainly the mm -hmm. same fellow. This does, though, seem to be the same, the same fellow. Right. Well, let's see, as we, as we move along here, um, question number two, I'll hand to Bryce. There's a fellow by the name of, of Julius. He's a centurion, and he is given the job of getting Paul to Rome. Uh, now the, the way things worked in those days, um, they, they didn't have a, they didn't have a Roman cruiser that they could somehow, or, or, or a Roman ship that they could just get on and, and it was owned by the state and they would, and they could take it straight to Rome. Uh, this centurion sort of had to, he had to be his own travel agent as it were. He, he'd have to find a ship that was going in the direction that he wanted to go. Um, and, and when it got him one leg closer to the destination, he'd have to find another ship that would, could get him the, the next uh, part of the way. And so, so that's this, this fellow's uh, job. He's responsible not only for, uh, for making sure that Paul gets to Rome, he, he's responsible for figuring out how to, get, how to get himself and everybody to Rome. Well, being in charge there, Bryce, of, of Paul, how does, how does he pre uh, treat Paul during this journey? It says in verse 3 that Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care when they put in at Sidon. So you got to remember, along with the responsibility, the, the authority to make these decisions, he's also going to be held responsible for whatever happens on this journey, that centurion will. And, and you see that fear later on in this chapter during the shipwreck portion when the soldiers had that same attitude of we're going to be held responsible if these prisoners get free. Uh, and, and as we know, there's considerable uh, punishment that could be had for such things. So um, for him to have this trust and consideration for Paul to allow him to go visit uh, his friends and receive care when they put in at Sidon, that, that took some, um, uh, you know, responsibility upon himself that uh, he, he was going to be held, held for. So uh, he, he had trust in him, I guess. Yeah, good point. It, it, and what is so neat is to see how Paul, he engenders this trust, this goodwill with just about everybody that he interacts with. In fact, the only people who don't, who don't give him that same benefit of the doubt are his own people. I, I, I've tried to mention it when it's come up, uh, but I, and we, we mentioned this sort of thing last quarter when we were studying Matthew, how so frequently when Jesus was preaching, it was his own people who put up the most resistance. There were Gentiles, there were total pagans who were much more receptive to his message than his own people were. Well, Paul keeps falling into the same boat. Uh, we have these pagans who recognize that Paul's a good man. Paul's a trustworthy man. He can even be trusted as a prisoner to go off and, and uh, be seen to by the brethren there in this city that they're just stopping over at. Go ahead, Tony. And this is remarkable when you think of the fact that Sidon was their first stop. How long had, had, had Julius been acquainted with Paul? Hmm. I mean, he may have been, it says that... Okay, in verse uh, one, they delivered Paul and the others to Julius, and he got on the boat. So it wasn't that Julius had known Paul for quite a while. How in the world did he gain that much trust in such a short time, that little leg from, from Caesarea to, to um, Sidon? Mm -hmm. So much that he would turn him loose mm -hmm. and let That's him go and say, okay, you be back here at a certain time. Now, it may be that, that God had granted him favor in the eyes of Julius. Don't know. But it is amazing 
that he would have that much uh, favor in Julius's eyes in such a short period of time. Yeah. Now, I, I would in, inject there, though, he did have soldiers with him. It is possible that a soldier was escorting them. Um, so, you know, just good consideration. Yeah. And I, I suppose it's also possible that uh, that Julius was stationed there, if you will, at Caesarea. And so he may have been under the command of, of Festus or even as far back as Felix. Uh, so you know, it, it, it's hard to say for certain that there was no prior relationship, but but nevertheless, a prisoner. <laughs> and, and he puts his trust in this prisoner the way he does. Yeah. Uh, when he, it, it uses the word liberty there. That's what I was going on, Bryce, yes. that he seemed to have just let him go. Now, that, you're right. It may not have been complete liberty. So I won't hold to that. Well, there is a lot of detail here about their journey, and and I, we won't spend we won't spend a lot of time on, on that sort of thing, just because you know we're we're not intimately familiar with the area. So it's I dare say that it wouldn't make that 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 much. Um, uh, well, I don't want to say wouldn't make that much difference, but you know we don't have a lot to relate to there. We could look at a map and we could see how. Uh, the direction that they take, that is the direction that typically the winds blow. You, you, you might say, well, would they just want to launch clear out across the Mediterranean Sea? No, they, they tend to hug the coast as much as they can, just because number one, it's safer. And number two, um, that, that's just the way the winds blow there. And, and in those days, they were just <laughs> there was no other al uh, alternative but to, uh, to let the wind carry you where it wished. Uh, you had very little say. Uh, if it wanted to go in a different direction. Well, so they, they make it a, a, a certain distance on this journey. And they are, um, it says, uh, it says uh, let's see, in verse seven, when we had sailed slowly with, uh, for many days and arrived with difficulty at Snidus or Cnidus, uh, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off, off Salmone. Uh, passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lasea. So I, I, I at least wanted to bring that portion in and note that it, it, it's, it's not going as fast as they would like it to. That seems to be the, the point that Luke is conveying to us here. And then he says, now, when much time had been spent, or I, some other translations I, I read uh, seem to convey more the idea of much time lost. Uh, again, this idea that uh, it's, it's, it's taken longer than we want it to. Um, but anyway, it said, uh, verse 9, when much time had been spent and sending was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul go, goes on to advise them uh, about something. Uh, so let me ask you, Isaac, I'll toss this question to you. Uh, the fast, what, what is the fast there? And uh, about what time of year did it occur? The fast almost certainly refers to the Day of Atonement, uh, a Jewish feast, a Jewish um, day of observance that they would have held. And I saw several dates as far as to, to actually pinpoint when it would have taken place, but more than likely it was somewhat uh, the latter portion of the year, September, late September, early October. Um, as They'll go on to make some decisions based on this, or at least Paul advises them to, to make some decisions based on the time of the year. But it's September, October time frame, um, getting into the winter months. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And of course, that that really is the big deal. If it, it, it just there's so much that we will see in in this chapter and in the next chapter that I I think. Um, we just don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It, it's just not a concern, and it has to do with the fact that we have modern means of transportation. We have, uh, in, in the next chapter, we have we have modern medicine. Uh, but these, if you wanted to go from, uh, well, in this case, Caesarea to Rome, uh, I mean, it was it was an ordeal, and it was going to take a while, and and there was very real danger to your life, and you had to, you really had to think. Well, wait a second, do do I want to launch off on this? on this portion of the journey when, when we're right here in winter. Uh, I'll throw one more thing in there. Just uh, if, if you're familiar with the Jewish feast, this probably is not news to you, but uh, you know, how do we go from this, this, this simple term, the fast, to the Day of Atonement? Why do we make that connection? If we look back in Leviticus chapter 23, 
Um, this is verse 27, and he says, on the 10th day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. Okay, well, what do they do on the day of atonement? A number of things, but among the things that he tells them to do uh, when we look in Numbers chapter 29, he, see, he says, again, 10th day, the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall afflict your souls, you shall not do any work. And so, so we see this afflicting your souls, it seems to be, uh, at the very least, including, if not speaking um, uh, uh uh, singularly of of fasting so that's that's where we make this connection between the fast and the day of atonement it's this, this afflicting of their souls that they were supposed to do well uh paul gives some gives a word of caution tony to the centurion who's in charge of him to the fellow who is the helmsman of the ship and even to the ship's owner they they are in a, a certain port that they they don't. They would really not rather have to spend the winter in. But what is what is Paul's word of caution to them, Tony? Well, just uh, backing up to verse nine, where it says, "I find it interesting." It says, "It was dangerous. Sailing was dangerous because the fast was over." Mm -hmm. If you just read that on the surface, you say, "Why is sailing dangerous? Because the fast is over." What is the connection between those two? And that. That has to do, as you said, and as Isaac said, with the time of year. So you have to do a little digging to find out uh, why sailing would be dangerous after the fast. Yeah. yeah. Because it had to do with the time of year. And as winter is coming on, uh, it's starting to get dangerous. And they just knew, the people knew that this is not the time to sail, the best time yeah. to sail. So Paul knew this and knew that sailing was dangerous and he because of his experience, I believe, uh, in sailing and with what, I mean, he'd been on the, the water many times. He said, man, I perceive that this voyage is going to end in disaster, that we're going to uh, shipwreck, we're going to lose the cargo, we're going to lose the ship, and we're going to lose our lives. And he says, I perceive this. And um, do remember that because you will need it later on. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Good point. So then somewhat along those lines, Bryce, should, should Paul have had any reason himself to be concerned for his own personal safety? Um, and, and if so, why? Or if not, why not? So I think the answer you're looking for is probably no, but I'll postulate that maybe yes and no. So okay. when uh, we talk about danger, we naturally want to go to think of in this case, death, uh, because Paul did mention loss of life. However, um, when we look at Acts chapter 23 and verse 11, we're reminded that uh, right after the commander had taken Paul by force into the barracks for fear that uh, he'd be torn to pieces by the mob, uh, we, we saw that the Lord came to him and said, be courageous for as you have testified of the truth about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome also. So we know here that Paul is supposed to make it to Rome. However, that was at least two years ago, maybe longer because, uh, you know, how long he was in custody there. And this happened at the beginning of that. But then on top of this, um, just because he's not going to die doesn't mean that he still could not be injured or harmed during this trip. Uh, so, um, we also see, though, that later on in, in verse uh, 23 and 24 of this chapter, when things get really bad, that an angel of the Lord appears to Paul and tells him, then do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Again, a reminder. And behold, God has graciously granted you also those who are selling with you. I know I partially answered part of question seven there, but I think it's important to bring it in here that Paul might have needed a little bit of encouragement and reminder. But either way, Paul is also given this because he needs to make that known to the crew. And as we see here, it's not just him that's going to be saved, it's also the crew. So there's my longer yes and no answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that it, it's a possibility that either this, this comfort or this, this promise that the Lord had given him two, over two years ago, uh, may not have been in the front of his mind at, at the time. Uh, but even, even if it was, Paul, Paul was concerned about the souls around him. And so even if he felt no 
no personal that well that is to say even if he did not think that he would be among those who would lose his life paul doesn't want anybody just to go launching off on some uh in some full hoard uh, foolhardy direction um and, and potentially lose their lives so this i think we get a glimpse into the character of paul here i, I will say too if you said he might have needed some encouragement we uh we think of paul as a as a superman and there's a verse in the next um in the next uh chapter when paul is able to meet some brethren uh once once they have made it to land and are on their way the last leg of their trip if you will to rome and it says that he took courage even paul needed to be encouraged from from time to time was this one of those cases perhaps perhaps not but uh certainly paul was he's a man like you and me and 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 he could get discouraged uh, from time to time. And there, there, there are times where we see that, in fact, he was encouraged by some brethren. Well, let me, let me ask you, Isaac, as you consider Paul's comments here, do you think that he was speaking by inspiration? Bryce has, has mentioned that he will get some definitive word from God on the matter here in a bit, but uh, is, is he doing that now? Is he sharing um, you know, God's own testimony or God's own prediction as to what's going to happen? I don't think this is a case where Paul is speaking by inspiration. So I came up with a list of three reasons why I don't believe he's speaking um, guided by the Spirit at this time. I think one, just looking at it um, from a logistical point of view, Paul's racked up some serious nautical miles on his three trips. And so he is an experienced man on the sea. Um, secondly, you tie that in with what verse 9 said about winter and Tony's point there about the waters becoming increasingly more perilous. I think he's looking out at the at the situation, recognizing we should not set sail. Let's just hunker down here in, in Fair Havens. And then the third thing, Paul's motivation seems to be his safety, the safety of those around him. Whereas the sailor, the centurion, seems like they might be more motivated by maybe commerce, maybe by incent, a financial incentive. Um, and if they're carrying prisoners, safety of the prisoner is probably not their highest priority. So putting those three things together makes me think Paul's not speaking by inspiration. Plus, one thing that Tony mentioned earlier, he does use the word, I perceive. This seems to yeah. be something that he is, as he surveys the, the land or the sea, in this case, he recognizes we really should not be setting, um, setting sail. And if you contrast that with the certainty and the intensity with which later he speaks about an angel and the, the revelation from God, there just seems to be a big difference. So I don't, to summarize, I don't think Paul is speaking by inspiration, but he's looking at what he sees and says, this is not wise for us to set sail at this time. Yep. Yep. I think you're exactly right. I, I'll also point out too, he, he says um, there's, there's going to be loss of, loss of the cargo, loss of the ship and loss of life if we do this. Um, obviously not all of those things come to pass. And so it would be a problem if we were to, conclu to conclude that Paul was speaking by inspiration, but but even if we set that aside, I don't I don't think that there's anything in the in the text that 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 makes that a necessary conclusion anyway. As as you've as you've pointed out, the number of things lead us to conclude Paul was uh, as as he does. There we'll even see this in um, in some of the letters, uh, some of the letters that uh, we uh, not have studied. Uh, during the course of studying Acts, but some letters that we have referred to and tried to tried to pinpoint as best we can the dates of their writing, he says, well, I, I'm planning to do this. He was not being informed by God as to what was going to happen. Uh, he's, he's just saying, well, this, this is what I hope to do. This is, this is what my intentions are. And uh, God did not order every single uh, step that Paul took. Uh, there's just, just like all of us, there's a certain amount of uh, a um, certain amount of uh, uh, leeway, I guess, uh, if I can put it that way, that, that we all have to take the information that we have that God has given us and then to, to do the best that we can on, uh, with that information. Well, as we, as we move along, we see that, of course, they, they don't listen to Paul. Um, they, they go ahead and they try to make for this other port that they think would be, would be better. They, they end up hitting a storm and they are, they, they are just beaten by this tempest for, for days. 
Uh, and then after enduring that for so long, I mean, they, they, they're battered by the storm. Um, it says that they don't see sun or star. I, I don't know quite what that looks like. I don't, I don't know if you ever, if it's just dark, pitch black the whole time, or if it's more of a sort of a dull gray in the daytime when in, at, at the nighttime, it certainly would be pitch black, but do you even get a hint of light in the daytime? I'm not quite sure what that looks like, but regardless, I, I think I'd be uh, I, I'd be scared to death out there. This, this would be totally out of my element. And here, even these seasoned sailors are scared to death. Well, it says, uh, as we read that um, in verse 20, uh, because the sun and the stars hadn't appeared for so, so very long, all hope that we would be saved, uh, they had finally given up. Well, Tony, they endured all that for so long. What hope was, fought, was Paul, rather, finally able to give them and on what condition? This is uh, just amazing. If you just consider how understated the Bible is, a Bible narrative is speaking about an incredibly perilous journey where the ship is being racked with waves and it, these people are sure they're about to die, but it's described in a very matter of fact way. But if you let your mind go to this and picture it, then you can see how um, desperate these men were and how in despair of their lives they were. Uh, and it says that they just, they'd given up. They just knew they were going to die. And they had not eaten for several days. And first of all, Paul says, man, I told you, you shouldn't have set sail. You should have listened to me, which really, if you think about it, gives gives them a little bit more credibility in their minds that I knew this and I warned you, but you didn't listen to me. So he says, but, but be encouraged anyway. Be encouraged. I urge you to take heart because there will be no loss of life. Whereas earlier he said, I perceive there will be loss of life. But now I know there will be no loss of life because an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve has stood by me this night and told me there will be no loss of life. So do not be afraid um, is what the angel said. The angel said, do not be afraid because you must be brought before Caesar. And indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. It's an interesting way of putting it, but Paul, yeah. God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. And then, Paul speaking to the men says, take heart, men, for I perceive, I believe that God will uh, do just what he has told us that he will do. However, we must run aground on a certain island, which, which does take place. Paul is not saying this is, God has told us it's going to be easy from here on. No, um, the ship is going down, the cargo is going down, but nobody will die. Yeah, I, I have always read the way he starts out there. Fellas, you should have listened to me. And it, at first blush, it sounds as if Paul's giving them an, uh, a see, I told you so. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's what it was. I think it's exactly what you pointed out, that he's saying, okay, guys, I, I did point out that we, we shouldn't have done this to begin with. So as you say, there's, there's some credibility he's trying to establish there. Um, but I, I'll tell you what, something I thought about when I was reading through this is uh, the similarity between this and Jonah. You know, Jonah has, has gone and boarded a ship uh, trying to flee the duty that God wants him to perform. And he's asleep uh, in, in the bottom of the ship and, and it's, it's uh, enduring a similar storm. And the captain comes down and he says, he says, arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us. So that we may not perish, and so uh, I I bring that in in order to make this point. There there may be a lot fewer people today on this earth who would be convinced if we were to say an an angel of my God has appeared to me and has assured me that that there will be no loss of life. Um, that was not the case with these folks. They may have been heathens. Uh, and, and in fact, they, they weren't too picky about what God might, might swoop in and deliver them. But if Paul said, an angel has appeared to me, the God that I serve has given me this, this information, that would have been great comfort to them. So not only can Paul say, well, 
I didn't think this was a good idea to begin with, but, but uh, so, something you can really hang your hat on in case you still doubt me. My God has told me this. He has sent an angel to give me this assurance. And so this, this should anyway have been great comfort to, to these men. Well, as we keep moving through the, the account here, um, when they realize they're, they're coming, uh, they're, they're about to, to run aground, they try to, to slow the ship down or, or get it to stop altogether as best they can. And they, they're casting out anchors. Well, well um, Paul has another condition for them as to whether and how they're going to be able to, to survive. And that comes about because uh, some of the sailors think, and this is our chance. We can, we can go to the back of the, or rather the front of the ship where the prow was, and we can, we can pretend as if we're throwing anchors out. But really what we can do is, is go and, and, and get on the lifeboat and take it to shore. You know, forget these folks. They can, they can make their own way. Uh, well, so then what then, what does Paul Bryce have to tell them uh, is one more condition as to what they need to do in order to make it safely to the shore? The, uh, speaking in particular to the centurion, by the way. So in, in verse 31, uh, he told the centurion and the soldiers that uh, unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. And I think that goes back, I mean, there's a practical matter, right, of once that lifeboat is gone and they're still so far out at sea, there's no way they're going to also be able to make it safely to shore. But I think this also really goes back to what Paul had stated just previously here that God came to me through his angel and said, not none of these souls are going to, to perish. Mm -hmm. Well, this is sort of that, that justification, that proof, right, that God is indeed in charge here. And for that to be without a question, they must all be saved by God, not by some of them taking matters in their own hands. Yeah. Uh, God's going to save them all at once from this ship, but you're going to do it God's way. You're not going to do it your own way. Yeah. And I'll throw in too, um, if, if God can do this, he can, he can do this any way he wants, right? I mean, so what if the sailors leave? Well, this, I'll have a little more to say about this in, in just a minute, but this, this seems to be an occasion in which, in which men, men need to put a certain amount of faith in God, in God and, and they, need to, they need to work things according to his plan, uh, rather than, as you said, uh, coming up with their own way out. Um, if these sailors leave, um, not only have they taken the only um, possible escape from the ship, uh, before it starts to break up, but uh, who's going to pilot this ship so that it does, in fact, run aground? They haven't actually reached that point yet, and so if these sailors, uh, if they, uh, you know, flee like rats from the ship, the, then not the the rest of the folks are not going to be able to to keep that ship on course and and get it actually to run aground the way Paul said that it'll have to. Um, there were some interesting comments that that Stringer had about this um, whole situation. Again, it goes back to, uh, well, Paul was assured that no life would be lost. He was assured that his life would not be lost. He's got to make it to Rome, in fact. So again, why, why is Paul so concerned? So let me, let me, let me share some of this with you. He, um, uh, he, he used an example, number one, where he said, okay, if, if God were to appear to you or send an angel to you and say, you're going to make it across town safely, would you then proceed to get in your car and, and drive across town on the wrong side of the road? Well, no, it's, that's in effect uh, tempting or testing God, uh, the kind of thing that we see Jesus uh, refuting the devil for when he's tempted by him in the wilderness in, in Matthew chapter 4. And, of course, he quotes Deuteronomy 6, verse 16, in order to refute the devil. Uh, no, you don't. When God gives you assurance, you don't, you don't test him. You don't sort of throw that back in his face. So let me just go ahead and, and read from, from his commentary here, because I, I think it's interesting. He, he pulls in some things from J.W. McGarvey as well. He said, I believe uh, the most perceptive comment on this matter is that of J.W. Garvey, uh, McGarvey. And here he quotes from McGarvey. McGarvey, I'm going to get that name right here in just a minute. Uh, he says, from this, we gather the lesson that when God makes us any promise, the realization of which can be any part rather can be in any part promoted by our own exertion, such exertion is an understood condition of the promise. In other words, um, uh, 
kind of like, uh, in fact, an example he brings up here is uh, when, when Jesus says, don't worry about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat. He's not saying just rest on your laurels. It's still expected that you will work to provide for yourself, but he just says, don't let the worry overtake you. Your exertion is still a, is still a part of um, uh, God coming through on his promise. Um, he, he continues quoting McGarvey, uh, McGarvey. He says that in decreeing that a thing shall be done or predicting that it will be done, God anticipates the voluntary actions of the parties concerned. And so if, if you can understand that it's necessary to work in order to realize God's promise that a faithful Christian will not starve, you know, per Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 and following, well, it, it shouldn't, shouldn't hamper our understanding of what's going on here with Paul. God has promised that Paul would make it to Rome. He's promised that all these men would make it to land, uh, but they have to work with, with, with God on that. They have, to, they have to put forth their own effort to bring that about. God's not just going to sort of, you know, pick them up and, and deposit them there. You know, there's, a, um, there's a, a passage in John 10 that many folks cite in order to, to come to the conclusion that uh, if once I believe in Christ, uh, then, then nothing can ever happen to me. There's, there's no chance that I can ever lose my salvation. You know, it goes by a number of names, the possibility of apostasy, once saved, always saved, eternal security, this idea that once I believe, I can never lose my salvation. Um, and the way that passage goes is this, my sheep hear my voice. This is John 10, verses 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus says, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And so people read that, and they say, well, you know, once I'm a Christian, well, it's smooth sailing. Nothing can ever happen that would cause me to lose my salvation. Well, back to McGarvey's point about exertion, uh, or uh, what did he say, voluntary action. You know, if if, I, if I'm following Jesus, that is voluntary action. You know, I, I'm not only coming to Jesus, but I'm following him. But when I quit following him, that's no longer the exertion or the voluntary action that, that is assumed when God says uh, that I will, that, that you will never be snatched from my hand. I can, I can perfectly well just walk away from, from God. That's not anybody snatching me. That's my walking away willingly. I can do that and I can lose my salvation. Uh, but, but again, I, 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 think, I think all these things paint the picture. What, what uh, Jesus was teaching in Matthew 6, what Paul is doing here by, by making sure that those who are supposed to benefit from God's promise don't uh, work in opposition to it. Um, and and this, this that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 10, it, it paints the picture. No, no, we've, we've got to work with God. Uh, it, we demonstrate our belief that God will keep his promises when we uh, continue to be faithful to him. Not when we, not when we sort of uh, uh, basically say, well, I don't know, will he, will he really? And, and, and try to try to put God to the test in that matter. And so then finally, um, not only oh, that, go, go ahead, I'm Tony. I'm going to throw in that uh, this was not going to be easy, as we mentioned before. And they're, they're about to be shipwrecked and they're, they're about to have to swim to shore on boards or uh, whatever floating flotsam they have or uh, and we as we said this is winter is coming on and we see that in the next chapter where they have to kindle a fire to stay warm so it's cold the water's probably pretty cold too this is not a comfortable situation where they're trying to swim ashore mm, yeah that's a good point good point well um the, uh, the centurion, just to sort of get back to the story here, the centurion listens to Paul, realizes, oh, wait, there's a plot afoot. And so then they, <laughs> they, they cut the, the, the rope so that the boat just falls to the sea. And so now, now they're all stuck. They're going to have to stay on this ship and they're going to have to have to run underground. Well, uh, that, as Tony says, that, that still doesn't make it a pleasant situation. And so here they have gone days and days without food. And, uh, and Isaac, what, what finally convinced the men to take food and, uh, and, and to take some encouragement? Are you seeing verse 33 through verse 36, two things. One, Paul verbally encourages them to take food. It seems everyone is still in that mindset of despair. You, I mean, you can imagine the anxiety of the knots in their stomach and 
why want you to continue the misery? So he verbally encourages him to, to take food. And then he sets the example. And it really seems in verse 36, it says, then they were all encouraged just after Paul had taken the bread, blessed it and begun to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. Paul has become a type of leader among the, for the entire ship. And they are following his example. Once they see this man has hope and this man is eating bread, they gain the encouragement they need and they also begin to eat bread. And then connecting that with what Tony just mentioned, this would be essential for their survival. Um, the elements are against them. They're out, they're about to shipwreck. Just they need this food for sustenance and to be able to make it to shore. Oh yeah. Boy, I, I really love what you pointed out there about how, how Paul has become a leader uh, um, among these men. He was not the leader. And, and yet uh, because of his, his confidence, um, because of the hope that he can offer them from God. I, I, I think one thing too that plays into this is, uh, okay, well, number one, there's something to, something to be said about an icebreaker. If, um, if everybody in the group is sort of expected, the, the, or, or if everybody in the group uh, thinks that everybody else expects me uh, not to eat, uh, well, I, I'm not going to eat. But then when Paul's the first one to do it, that, that, that makes it all right, as it were, for everybody else. I, nobody else is having to step out the, and be, there and be the first man and perhaps uh, suffer um, scrutiny of any sort. But I dare say that it's significant that when he takes this food, he stops and he gives thanks. There, there is something very powerful, regardless of the situation, when, when you can just turn your thought toward God. Um, I, I dare say that was part of uh, of these men uh, to gaining some encouragement here. Uh, Paul has just, it, it, they're not just taking food, but they are putting their trust in a God who has told them that they are going to, going to make it. So uh, a lot of powerful things going on here, I think. Well, um, there's the ship that's, uh, that is about to break apart and uh, it's, not just the shipwreck, I mean, obviously a treacherous thing that they're having to endure, but yet another uh, threat to Paul's life arises, Tony. What, what is that? And then who manages to intervene to save him? Well, this, these soldiers, these Roman soldiers who had the care of, of these prisoners, and we find, uh, I don't know how many prisoners there were, but there were 276 persons on board this ship. And mm. Don't know who, what the uh, breakdown of the uh, people was, but there were prisoners, plural, on this ship. And these soldiers, as you mentioned, I think earlier, Brad, um, they had the care of these men uh, placed on them. And maybe Bryce mentioned it earlier also that they were under the, the threat of punishment to the point of death if they were to let these men go the prisoners who had been not entrusted, that's the wrong word, but had, had been given to them and given them the, uh, the command, the responsibility that you must deliver them. Um, I guess the second best plan was um, to, to just put them to death. You know, as we see the Philippian jailer, he, he decided not to, he figured that a lot of them had already escaped. So his best course of action was to kill himself. Mm. To avoid the uh, the, the uh, execution that he was surely due, but these men thought, okay, we have a chance to kill these men, and thus sparing our lives. But uh, this centurion Julius, once again, uh, is is looking out not just for Paul, but also these men, and I think he believed Paul when Paul said, "We're not going to die. God has granted to you all these souls." and you're going to, we're going to make it to land and we're going to be saved. I think the centurion believed that. So he um, thwarted their plan and would not let them uh, put the prisoners to death. Yeah, I, I, good point. I, I, I think you're exactly right. Not only did he have a certain fondness for Paul, I, I think, <laughs> by this time, but I, I, I think he believed too. I think that's a, that's a really good point. Well, we're, we're coming to the end of the chapter here where we're going to have to sort of leave off on a cliffhanger, but uh, they, they, uh, they, they end up in the, in the, uh, in the water there uh, and uh, have to make their way to land. 
Uh, and we do end on a high note. Uh, they, they do escape safely, as it says in verse four, and, and they make it to land. But uh, as we consider the life of Paul that we have seen so far and, and some of the tidbits that we get elsewhere in the epistles, just right quick, uh, Bryce, how many times does this make that Paul has been shipwrecked that we know of? This would be at least the fourth time. Uh, there's this occasion plus the three times that are mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, where Paul says, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I spent adrift at sea. And then he goes on to mention other things, uh, such as in verse 26, his frequent journeys and the associated dangers that included dangers from rivers and at sea. So uh, again, as we covered earlier in the class, uh, the second Corinthian letter would have been written before this point in, in the timeline of Acts. So those three plus this one would be four. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, th there may be other things that have happened that, that uh, Luke just chose or the Holy spirit chose not to include in our accounts because they haven't so much played into uh, the, the point that uh, this, that God is trying to get across in a particular passage of scripture. But uh, I, I, something that, that, that this says to me is that this business of taking time and going to the trouble of figuring out when these various letters were written, it, it's not for no reason. Um, it's not just an academic exercise. Uh, literally years, I thought that, I mean, I would get to first or second Corinthians rather, where he mentions these three times he was, he was shipwrecked. And I, and I just assumed that the occasion in the Acts was, was one of those three times. No, this is this is after that. So this, this is at least the fourth time <laughs> that he's been shipwrecked. Uh, and, and you wouldn't know that if you didn't take all of the New Testament into account and have some at least sort of a framework in your mind as to when certain books were written so that you can put all the information together. So that's the main reason I wanted to bring in this, this, uh, well, this little point. It may point have played here. into his perception. It may have played into his perception of why they were going to have a shipwreck. He'd yes. seen this before. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I've seen this movie before. I know how it happens, Yeah, how it ends. Well, just a, a couple of closing comments here as, uh, as we close out the lesson. Um, I made uh, some comments with regard to historical and geographical accuracy. Um, something from the Waldron book here, authorities on sailing tell us uh, or tell how in circumstances, circumstances such as these, which is to say when they're facing a storm like this, a small sail was usually left on the bow to let the wind pull the ship along. And if they steered to the right as near the wind as possible, calculations have shown that they would reach Melita or Malta, as we'll see here in the first verse of the next chapter where they have ended up. They will re reach Melita or Malta in about 13 days. Uh, so if, if you recall a little bit farther up, they had been, uh, they'd been drifting and enduring the battering of the storm for about 14 days. And so this, this matches up just perfectly with, uh, with what authorities say would, would happen in a case like this. And I'll throw in one more thing. I, it, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's striking to me because we have read so much of the book of Acts and, and all of it up to this point is almost exclusively, uh, okay, yes, this person went here, but it was to preach to this to this person or this group of persons, or it, it's because uh, Paul was carrying the gospel to different places, or we have, uh, whether it's Acts uh, 15 or, or uh, maybe significant portions of Acts 2, where we have significant portions of, of a chapter devoted to doctrinal discussion or, or sermons. Um, in contrast, we've got a lot of, well, we sailed here, then we sailed here, and, and then we waited for a little while, and then we sailed here. You know, what, why does Luke, why does the Holy Spirit give us all of this detail? And this is a, at least a possibility that Johnny Stringer proposed. He said, perhaps the Lord's purpose for so detailed account was to emphasize dramatically the fact that nothing could prevent God from accomplishing his desire for Paul to reach Rome. He had promised that Paul would, would uh, preach in Rome, and despite all the seemingly insurmountable problems and hopeless predicaments of the voyage, Paul preached in Rome. Uh, and that, that seems like as good a reason to me, because I don't know about you, other than, you know, maybe being able to follow it on the map. I was, I was having trouble seeing 
Uh, wh why is Luke giving us all these details? It's probably to show us that that uh, when it looks like th there's just no possible way that this, gonna, that this is going to work, it seems like every step of the way, whether whether his own people are going to kill him or or he's going to be taken out by the weather or or the soldiers who are responsible for him are going to end up putting him to death. Nope. Uh, God manages providentially to uh, to see Paul through every one of these difficulties, and he's going to make it to Rome, as we finally see in the next chapter. Well, that brings us to the end of chapter 27. I uh, want to uh, thank you, fellas, for your participation. Tony, Bryce, Isaac, thank you so much, uh, and thank you for watching. I uh, hope you'll be with us next time as we finish up the book of Acts. We'll do that uh, on, on Wednesday, uh, finish up with Acts chapter 28, and if you have any questions about this class or any of the things that you, you have seen us uh, preach at or, and teach at Pepper Road here on YouTube, uh, feel free to leave a comment in uh, the comment section. We'd be glad to, to answer any questions that you have. Or you can contact us at our website, pepperroadchurch.org, and there's a contact link where you can send us a question. Uh, we'd love to have a Bible study with you in person if you're here in North Alabama, or we can do some sort of a of a remote thing like uh, we're doing here on Zoom or with Skype or something, uh, Google uh, Hangouts or whatever they're calling it these days. Be glad to do something like that with you. Just love the opportunity to open up the Bible with you. So please get in touch if we can, we can help at all. Again, thank you for watching, and we hope that you'll join us on Wednesday. And may God bless you in your studies of his word.